All right, so we're in this uh, chapter on psychrometrics, and last time we talked about dry air. What's particular about dry air? What's the partial pressure of water vapor in dry air? Zero. There's no water vapor. So that if I have the total pressure of the mixture, it's basically only dry air in the mixture. All right. How about moist air? Well, uh, actually, it's easier to talk about saturated air. Saturated air is the partial pressure of water vapor is equal to what? The saturation pressure at that temperature of the mixture. And where do we get that saturation temperature? Out of the tables, out of your uh, steam tables. And so the total pressure is always the dry air plus whatever the vapor is exerting. If it's saturated air, it's exerting the saturation pressure. All right. So if you have moist air, you know that the partial pressure of the water vapor is between dry air, zero, and the maximum saturation pressure for that whatever condition it is. Okay. Now today we're going to talk about three temperatures and two humidities. I wish I could say that you know, this is equally difficult, equally difficult, equally difficult. No, no, no. These are, the first one on temperature is E-A-S-Y, easy. The next one is hard, and the next one is hard. All right. Likewise, for our humidities, we have two humidities. The first one is relatively easy. The next one is hard. Often it's because it's un you're not familiar with it. It's new to you. So let's just persevere here. So we have our discussion of dry air, saturated air, moist air. I already summarized it. One other thing I forgot to summarize back here, I'll add it, is often we're interested in calculating rho for both the dry air or rho for the vapor in the mixture, moist air mixture. So what is the rho? Well, it's how many, what's the mass of the dry air, how many kilograms of dry air per unit volume of the mixture, is it not? Isn't that what rho is? All right. Likewise, it's the mass of the vapor in the same volume, one cubic meter, of the moist air mixture. Okay. Can I use the ideal gas equation to get rho of both of these? Yeah, they both behave as ideal gas gases as independently. They're just mixed of ideal gases. So rho is equal to the partial pressure of the dry air times the molar mass of the dry air divided by R bar temperature. And likewise, this would be the partial pressure of the vapor. What could that be between? Well, it's between zero and P sat, isn't it? The maximum would be, if it's saturated air, it would be satur saturation pressure. Okay, the molar mass of the vapor divided by R bar T. Hey, can you quickly remind, my, remind me, what is the molar mass of dry air? 28.97 kilograms per kilomole. What is the molar mass of vapor? 18.02 kilograms per kilomole. So every now and then, we need to uh, just get the density or the reciprocal of the density, specific volume for the dry air or the water vapor in the mixture. All right. Why do I show this table? What is this column right here in table A2? Saturation pressure. And they give it as a function of temperature. So if I wanted it at 20 degrees C, there it is. This is in bar. If I wanted it in kilopascal, just multiply by 100, 2.339 kilopascal. Okay. So these three temperatures, the first one you have a lot of experience with. It's the dry bulb temperature. Why did they come up with the name dry bulb? Think of the old thermometer, and at the end of the thermometer is a sensing element, the bulb. And it's usually filled with a little fluid at the bulb is uh, experiences a higher temperature then the fluid wants to expand and it pushes itself further up the tube 
in a thermometer. Okay, so you have a lot of experience. If I said, what's the temperature of the air in this room? Most of you say, oh, about 72F, oh, 73F, 75F, something like that. You're telling me the dry bulb temperature in this room. Basically, the wet bulb temperature, you take a, another uh, thermometer and the bulb down here is doing the sensing and you try to keep it wet. All right, well, how are you going to keep it wet? You put a little sock on it, like a little t-shirt, and that little sock is connected to a reservoir that has a lot of water in it. And the wicking, so that sock remains wet. Like, a, How can we uh, measure the wet bulb temperature? Well, I bring today a little pass around. It's called a sling psychrometer. You just pull it out, you have two sections. It bends like this. You grab one section and you, what do you call that for the mechanical action? My wrist is making it go in a circle, slinging it around. Now, what do I sling around is I have two thermometers on it. One, the sensing element is just exposed to the air that it's flowing through. The other has a little sock. It's connected to a reservoir on the end that I, with a little bit of water, I don't want to spill it out if there's any dripping out right there. And so one thermometer stays wetted and the other is the dry bulb temperature. Now, which temperature do you think is lower? The wet bulb. So after you spin it, you don't have to spin it that long, 30 seconds, 45 seconds. First of all, you shouldn't put hot water in it or you shouldn't put cold water in it. You should put room temperature water in it. Well, I left it in my office, so it's pretty well room temperature water. And now if I spin it probably for about a half a minute to a minute, it'll come into equilibrium. I stop it, I uh, turn it, and I can look. Oh, it's about 72 in here and about 60 on the wet bulb. That tells me how much humidity there is in the room, the difference between the wet bulb and the dry bulb. Because if it's very dry in this room, the wet bulb becomes much lower. If I spin it in a very humid room, guess what? The wet bulb is close to the dry bulb. If I spin it in a room of saturated air, there's no evaporation. The wet bulb is equal to the dry bulb. So basically, it, it tells me the humidity. So I can now turn it I can put the two pieces together, push it in or out so far, such that it lines up where the 75 or 72 degree dry bulb uh, mark matches with the 60 degree wet bulb mark, and I read off the relative humidity in this room. We're going to talk about relative humidity in a minute, but I'm going to pass this around. The next temperature is the dew point temperature. You have a lot of experience with dew. How many people have uh, ever worn glasses or are wearing glasses and they go in and out of different environments and then the glasses fog up? That's the same thing here. How many people have ever had a cold beverage and uh, in the August they set it on the table and somebody hollers, hey, get a coaster under that because it's going to start you know, sweating and then they make a big puddle down there. Well, that's all do, doing out. Where is that water coming from? From the moist air. Okay, and so we're going to talk about the temperatures. So in this room right here, we know it's dry bulb temperature. Oh, about 72 degrees F. We know it's numeric value for the wet bulb. If it was very dry, the wet bulb would be very low. If it was very humid, the wet bulb would be higher. It's around 60 degrees F wet bulb. There's also a value of temperature for the dew point right now in the room. This air temperature right in here. It, it tells you... Basically, if I started to cool the air in this room without changing the pressure, I would cool it to a temperature at which it would start to dew out. That's what the dew point temperature is. Or if I put a cold surface in the room, a cold surface, I would get water forming on that cold surface if it was at or below the air's dew point temperature. Okay, so there you go. So again, the easy one, think of the dry thermometer bulb. It pushes it up higher and higher on the stem if it's higher temperature. 
Or even now you just read off, oh, what's the temperature in this room? 72, 75. That's the dry bulb temperature. This wet bulb, a little more complicated. I'm passing around this sling psychrometer. They have the sock that keeps one wet. One of the temperature elements is dry. You have to read both of them. Then you can insert, read off the scale, and they're showing you how you can then infer what the humidity is or read it off. And here is your experience with a cold surface. Cold surface in a warm, uh, moist air environment, you will get condensate form and then it'll drip. You all have experience with that. What are we showing here? On a cold winter day, if you have a single pane window, the inside of your house is nice and warm, often you'll get condensate there and it'll drip down on the inside of the house. All right, a uh, clicker question. Why is the wet bulb temperature less than the dry bulb temperature? And what the wet bulb has, has a sock of water that keeps it replenished because it's gonna evaporate off of that sock into the room. So it's basically, isn't it evaporation from the wet bulb that keeps the wet bulb at a lower temperature than the dry bulb? Temperature wet bulb lower than the temperature dry bulb. Let's go ahead and grade it. And hmm, why did some people go for condensation? Well, if you condensed on the wet bulb, the temperature would be, it would be like adding heat. Anyway. All right, that's the best answer. Here's another one. When the wet bulb temperature equals the dry bulb temperature, when does that happen? Temperature wet bulb equal to the temperature dry bulb. <clears throat> if the air is saturated, if you're, you have that sling psychrometer, right? And it's twirling around. And if the air is saturated, that means you can't add any more moisture to the air. Uh, so there's no potential for evaporation to occur. For evaporation to occur, it would have to take moisture in one direction from the sock covering the wet bulb and put it into the air. The air can't handle it anymore. There's no evaporation. They're the same temperature. So air has considerable amount of water vapor. That makes the most sense. Yes. Uh, when the surface temperature, the temperature of the surface, uh, is less than the dew point temperature of the surrounding air, then what? And water will condense. Let's continue on. Maybe you have had glasses. Maybe you wear glasses. Maybe you've had a lot of experience with glasses fogging up. Maybe this is what glasses, when they really fog up, look like, right? Okay, so glasses fog up when? Either A, B, C, or D. When do you get condensate? You get condensate on a surface, and the glasses are the surface of interest. When the glass surface is cold and you expose it to warm, humid air. That's when you get it. Uh, okay. Um, so what makes sense? Well, the glasses, if they start out where they're cold, either they're cold from being inside in the middle of summer, or they're cold from being outside in the middle of winter. Either one happens. So if you move from cold to warm, and so this is kind of a winter application, you, move, you walk inside a warm, hot, you know, sweaty place like a interior of a house or a gym or something, and you're coming from the cold parking lot where your glasses are cold, or when you're uh, inside the house and you step outside in the summer, and it needs to be a warm, humid day in the summer, not a warm, dry day in the summer. 
Okay, so both of those work. Professor, that's kind of bad, where both D and B are correct, right? But I'm going to grade both of them as correct. Right? All right. Somebody uh, said, hey, it also happens if you're hot and sweaty and your face is really hot and sweaty and you have your glasses laying on the table and the table is by some air conditioned vent or something and they're really cold and if you put those cold glasses on your hot sweaty face they'll fog up on the inside too there's plenty of applications of this where your temperature of the glass or the temperature of the surface is at or below the dew point temperature of the hot, humid air in the surroundings of that surface. It's easiest to think of surface and then hot, humid air. But you can also have a tube or a pipe and it ejects some sort of air mixture into a different air mixture. Here, if I inject a warm, or I'm just going to say hot, humid, stream why hot because if it's warm it can carry a lot of water vapor if i inject that into a cold environment what will happen is is it'll start to cool these gases and it's not a surface that's cold but it's changing the temperature rapidly and then you'll get the you'll be able to see it you'll be able to see the white condensate droplets forming so here's tailpipes somewhere in the cold you know day in san antonio maybe you've seen that coming out the tailpipe that white wispy cloud also if you have a cooling tower they spray in water at the top the mechanical fans pull this out and throw it out they run the air conditioning or make chilled water plants all the time even on cool days so they're making this hot, humid exhaust out of the top of the cooling tower. And if you have cold air coming over it, guess what this looks like? And a lot of the people in the public say, that power plant is really polluting the environment. And they're complaining about condensate, really. That's what they're complaining about. But people just, you know, need to be educated. They need to be informed that, no, what you're seeing is not a bunch of pollution. It's just condensate off of a cooling tower or out of a smokestack where you're just bringing out a humid uh, humidity high humidity all right another one when moist air is introduced in the cooler surrounding air then condensation can occur you know what goes out that tailpipe somebody says I don't really consider what goes out the tailpipe of my car as air. Yeah, you don't want to be breathing it, but I know. But it's, it's some sort of moisture-laden air stream, gas stream. And when you put that into a cooler air stream, that's when you get the condensation. All right, very good. Okay, in summary, we had the dry bulb. It's what you consider your normal temperature. The wet bulb, why is it wet? It's due to evaporation. When do you get a lot of evaporation? When it's drier and drier and drier air, okay? Uh, you get a great uh, temperature difference between the wet bulb, which will always be less than the dry bulb temperature. When it equals the dry bulb, that's because there's no potential to evaporate, and it's saturated air. It's that's when the wet bulb is equal to the dry bulb. When is the wet bulb greater than the dry bulb? Never. It doesn't make any sense. Okay, the dew point temperature. Well, when you cool the air to a temperature such that that temperature, the saturation the pressure of the water vapor uh, matches the current partial pressure of the water vapor in the moist air. That's the de one way, a good way to define the dew point temperature. So in this room, I said, there's a temperature known as the dew point temperature for this humid air in this room. Think of it as taking the humid air in this room and cooling it until it starts to condense. And it would be like a little bit of a cloud and the, the little water droplets would fall out. Sometimes you can see it. It's called FOG. 
sometimes you can't see it, it just collects on the top of surfaces, your car in the, in the middle of the night or in the early morning hours, and then you, you, can, you see the evidence of it but have, have, having that water settle out. But sometimes you can get a lot of water droplets forming and then you have that fog. Okay, they kind of condensate. All right. Two humidities. One is easy. It's a relative humidity. It's what the weatherman reports all the time. Oh, we have high humidity, low humidity, 75% humidity. And now what is the definition of this relative humidity? Well, most people wouldn't recall that it's a mole fraction of the water vapor in the moist air mixture divided by the absolute maximum possible mole fraction at the same pressure and temperature. Now, I know that's a concept. Let me kind of repeat that. This would be the max. Don't, don't change temperature and pressure. They have the same temperature and pressure here for both the numerator and denominator. But one is the current actual condition. What is the mole fraction of the water vapor in the moist air mixture? The last one is what would be the maximum if it was saturated air at the same temperature and pressure? What would be that mole fraction? Okay, so then you can see that it's from zero to 100 percent. Okay, what was uh, with a Dalton's model and partial pressure concept? The partial pressure of vapor is equal to the mole fraction of the vapor in the mixture times the total pressure of the moist air mixture, right? So you can replace this by having the partial pressure of the vapor by the total pressure, the partial pressure of the vapor maximum by the total pressure. So the, the division by the total pressure is canceled. And so most people would remember or think that the relative humidity is a ratio of pressures, partial pressure of the water vapor currently in the moist air divided by what is this maximum? Isn't that P sat? The saturation pressure at the dry bulb temperature? Yeah, that would be the maximum partial pressure. So most people, that's the way we use it too. We would say, okay, give me the partial pressure of the vapor in the moist air mixture. Well, if I knew relative humidity and then I knew the temperature such that I could look up the saturation pressure, I would be able to get you the partial pressure. All right. Now, this one was relatively easy. This one's a little harder, but guess what? The engineers who design HVAC systems and layouts and all that, this is the one they like. This is the one they use. A lot of calculations. They like the humidity ratio. Okay, well, what exactly is it? Well, it's a ratio of the mass that's vapor in our moist air mixture divided by the mass dry air. So it's a mass over mass. So SI units for mass would be like kilograms. So kilograms per kilogram. That means it's dimensionless. Yes, it is dimensionless. But I like to put kilogram V versus kilogram DA. Because it's, I know it's dimensionless, but it's kilograms of what? Vapor per kilogram of what? Dry air. Now, if I have a, a mixture here, let's think about one cubic meter volume. One meter cubed volume, okay? I can find out how many kilograms of water vapor are in that one cubic meter of space. True? I could then find out how many kilograms of dry air are in that one cubic meter of space. I take the ratio, that's my humidity ratio, omega. Okay. All right. Somebody says, uh, how do I work with this a little bit? Well, let's do this. Um, take this definition and uh, put and divide by volume on both numerator and denominator. If I divide by volume, mass per unit volume, isn't that the mass density of vapor? divided by the mass density of dry air? Sure is. Okay, what would be an equation to calculate the mass density of vapor? Okay, I would say it's gonna be the partial pressure of the vapor 
times the molar mass of the vapor divided by r bar t. Where did that equation come from? Hey, you're experts in the ideal gas equation, are you not? Yeah, that's what it is. And now do the same thing for dry air. We have the partial pressure of the dry air. We have the molar mass of the dry air. We have r bar, the universal gas constant, and then you have t. Why do the r bars cancel? They're the same. Why the temperature? They're the same temperature. What's not the same are the partial pressures and the molar masses. So if you just rewrite this as the molar mass of vapor divided by the molar mass of dry air times the partial pressure of the vapor divided by the partial pressure of the dry air. So that is one way that you use this humidity ratio, or at least how to make a calculation to calculate it. Okay. Somebody remember, uh, what is the molar mass of uh, dry air? 28.97. Somebody else, remember, what's the molar mass of water vapor? 18.02. Um, Jump on your calculator, run that, and tell me what number you get to five significant digits. Zero point six two two zero two. All right. Since eighteen point oh two is known to four significant digits and twenty eight point nine seven is the four significant digits, should I express the ratio as to more than four digits? No. So let's express it to four digits. If you expressed it to four digits, wouldn't it be point six two two zero? And forget the zero. There you go. And then we put the uh, partial pressure of the vapor over the partial pressure dry air. Now, a lot of people in the HVAC industry, they will know that equation. They'll use that equation. It's coded up somewhere. And then they'll say, somebody like, hey, where did that 0.622 come from? And they'll go, I don't know. It's in the book. No, really, where did that, I don't know. I use it so often, but it's like, where did pi come from? I really don't know. 3.141, you know what I mean? Sometimes you just start using things, and it's like you forget where it comes from. It just is a ratio of molar masses. That's it. But 6.622. Now, let's take a look at this equation. So omega is equal to a constant, 0.622. PV, what exactly is PV? The partial pressure of the vapor in my moist air. What would be the maximum PV would be? The saturation pressure at the dry bulb temperature. If it was saturated air, that's how high it would be. All right, what is P of DA? Is it the total pressure of the moist air mixture or is it the partial pressure of the dry air in the moist air mixture? It's the partial pressure, yeah, part B, yeah, give it a selection B, not A. It's the partial pressure of the dry air in the moist air mixture. So sometimes they'll write this equation. They'll say omega is equal to 0.622 PV divided by P minus PV. Well, what is that P without a subscript? That just is your total mixture pressure, the sum of the dry air plus the vapor pressure. Look good? Thank you very much. Let's continue on. Oh, that's all what I just repeated for the relative humidity. Starting from the general definition in terms of a ratio of Ys <coughs> to a ratio of partial pressures or pressures. And then this is how you would use it. Uh, typically, you just multiply the saturation pressure times relative humidity, get the partial pressure of the water vapor in the mixture. All right. <coughs> Okay, let's solve this problem. A room contains air at 29C and 97 kilopascal. The partial pressure of the water vapor is given in kilopascal. Determine the partial pressure of the dry air. How do you calculate the partial pressure of the dry air? <coughs> Isn't it the total room pressure minus the vapor pressure? So it's just 97 minus... <coughs> Excuse me, I'm coughing. 97 minus 3.364 kilopascal, done with part A. What about the relative humidity? How are you going to calculate the relative humidity, phi? How about I pause? You've got to make the calc. 
we, we learned the relative humidity in terms of mole fractions, but everybody uses it in terms of uh, pressures. And it's the actual partial pressure of the vapor in the mixture divided by the maximum that it ever could exist or exert at that same temperature. So uh, what we have to do is we have uh, 3.364 uh, kilopascal for the, the current partial pressure of water vapor, but we have to look up the saturation pressure at a temperature of 29 degrees C. Where do we get that? Well, we get it from this table. So you'd go look, uh-oh, well, I have to scoot down. Maybe I have it on 29 degrees C. 29 degrees C, 0. 0.04008 bar. So 4.0, oh, I forgot the number, 08, something like that. And when you make the calculation, it's 84% 80, relative humidity. Look good? Okay. What about the dew point temperature? Oh, this one's tricky. The dew point temperature. Conceptually, think about cooling it until it becomes saturated air. So, um, so you're looking for the temperature, the dew point temperature, such that the saturation pressure at that dew point temperature is actually equal to the current partial pressure of the water vapor. So we want to find this temperature of the dew point such that PSAT is equal to 3.64 kilopascal. Go back to my table and I find out where it's 3.364. I may have to interpolate 3.364, no, 3, somewhere in this vicinity, right? So the dew point temperature is right at 26 degrees. All right, uh, what about the mass of water vapor in a volume of one cubic meter? Well, that would be take the density of vapor multiplied by the volume, or this would just be the mass of the vapor in one cubic meter is equal to the partial pressure of the vapor, the molar mass of the vapor, the volume of one cubic meter divided by the universal gas constant dry bulb temperature. So, and when you put in the numbers and run them, you'll get a very small amount. How many grams is this? 24 grams. It's not much. It's just a little bit of weight or mass. All right, last one, humidity ratio. Isn't that omega? It's defined as how many kilograms of water vapor per kilogram of dry air. We calculate it using 0 0.622, the partial pressure of the vapor, and then the partial pressure of dry air. So 0.622, then uh, this was uh, 3.364, and then we already did the partial pressure of dry air, 93.636, and you calculate this small number. It's typically, you know, 0 0.01, 0 0.02, it's low number, the humidity ratio, omega. All right, can I move on? Are we okay? Okay, uh, you can play conceptual games. I encourage you to do that. Start with some initial condition where it's uh, humidity is given, the dry bulb temperature is given, the dew point temperature you calculate, the omega, the humidity ratio you calculate, and then just cool it and cool it and cool it and cool it and cool it. What will happen is omega stays the same until you hit the dew point temperature and then if I cool it to 26 it dews out some moisture some water vapor goes out it condenses settles to the floor you know it droplets some mass of water vapor goes out of the ideal gas mixture and, and when that happens the humidity uh, 
ratio, omega goes down because you're condensing somewhere. All right. And now you're at 100% relative humidity. You just stay at 100% relative humidity. And the dry bulb temperature and the dew point temperature are the same as you continue to cool it. You could also calculate wet bulb and put it up here. And at this point, the wet bulb would be 27C, then the wet bulb would be 26C, the 20, wet bulb would be 25C as you continue to cool it. And when you hit that point where it's 100% relative humidity, the wet bulb, the dry bulb, and the dew point temperature are all the same temperature. All right. So we covered a lot of ground. You need to talk about kind of three states of the air, from dry air to saturated air, and in between is moist air. Three temperatures and two humidities. Now you're equipped to solve a lot of engineering problems. We have moist air coming in at T1 of uh, 34 degrees C and a pressure P1 of one bar, that's given right here in the illustration, and a relative humidity phi1 of 35%. It enters a heat exchanger operating at steady state. So this is my heat exchanger. And a volumetric flow rate, AV state 1, is uh, 10 meter cube per minute. Isn't that a good volumetric flow rate? And so AV, not area times volume, but area times speed, gives you a volumetric flow rate. I think that's consistent with a lot of fluid mechanics notation. All right. It uh, is cooled, and it exits at 22 degrees C at state 2, and a one bar pressure. Okay. Ignore the kinetic potential energy effects. Determine the dew point temperature at the inlet. Well, I'm just going to say that I'm going to talk about it for a minute before we make the calculation, but it's 16.4. What does that mean? I can cool it from 34 to 33 to 32 to 31. I can cool it down to 16.4 degrees C before it condenses. But once it starts to condense, if I tried to cool it to 15 degrees C, or 14 degrees C, or 12 degrees C, or whatever, below the dew point temperature, I'm going to get some condensate. I need to put a little drip pan in here and pull off the liquid. But in this case, it exits at 22. Do I have any liquid form that I need to collect in a pan and pull off as liquid out of this heat exchanger? No. It's a very simple problem to begin with. Later, we got to worry about condensate. We'll do that. Not today. All right. So now, how do I make the calculation and show that the dew point temperature is 16.4? You're going to need these tables. And so what you do is you have to find out what is that partial pressure of the water vapor in my moist air mixture at state 1. What is that equal to for this case? You're given the relative humidity at 1. You multiply by PSAT at the dry bulb temperature of 34 degrees C, right? That gives me PV. Once I know PV, what do I do? I look for where PV is equal to PSAT, and that temperature is my dew point temperature. And it'll come in around 16.4 degrees. Should I spend time on it numerically, or is that good enough? Should I give you a minute to do it numerically, or is that good enough? All right, go for it. And those that don't have the tables, you're going to need that table, but it's not really readable, is it? And you need to scroll down, and you need to grab it at both 34. And then I said the, the dew point's around 16. So... This number right in here is very important. And then you should be looking in here to interpolate somewhere around 16. We'll move to part B. The mass flow rate of the moist air at the exit. Well, 
Hmm. What are they asking for? They're asking for how many kilograms of vapor plus how many kilograms of dry air per minute, aren't they? I mean, this kilogram is the combination because it's moist air. They're asking not to, don't give me the mass flow rate of water vapor at the exit. They're not asking give me the mass flow rate of dry air at the exit. They say the mass flow rate of moist air at the exit. That's both of them, isn't it? Okay. Well, let me ask you this. Uh, what's the difference between the mass flow rate of air at the exit versus the inlet? They're the same. You're a genius. How did you get to that conclusion so fast? Conservation of mass for the little control volume that they show right there. What's in is out. I'm saying there's no, no air is being lost. And the, no water vapor is condensing, so it all goes in and out. So it's the same. So we could actually say, I'm going to calculate it at the inlet. All right, if you wanted to calculate it at the inlet, how do I calculate that? Well, how about if I do this? Why don't I calculate the mass flow rate of the vapor and add it to the mass flow rate of the dry air? Won't that give me the mass flow rate of the moist air? All right, the mass flow rate of the... Um, let me do this. If I take th both sides of this equation and I divide by and multiply by the mass flow rate dry air divided by mass flow rate dry air. That seems silly. But what you pick up is mass flow rate of dry air times 1 plus the mass flow rate of vapor divided by the mass flow rate of dry air is exactly the same as what is omega? Engineers love that term once they get used to it. That's my humidity ratio. So all I have to do is calculate the humidity ratio on the inlet. What's the humidity ratio at the inlet state 1? 0.622, the partial pressure of the water vapor on the inlet. Um, I'm sure I calculated that right over here, which we already calculated. And then we take P minus PV. And so we calculate omega 1 from the inlet. And then that goes right here. Now, what is the mass flow rate of the dry air? Well, you have a volumetric flow rate given, do you not? So if I multiply the density of the dry air coming in times the volumetric flow rate coming in, doesn't that give me the mass flow rate of the dry air coming in? Professor, where are these equations on my equation sheet? The mass flow rate of the dry air, is that going to be the, how, what's the mass density of dry air on the inlet times how many volume, you know, how much volumetric flow rate is coming in in the inlet? Yes, sir. Because I put, I just took this equation and put one plus omega one. Okay, then you can do it this way. You can go a little bit longer and just say, calculate the mass flow rate of the vapor, which would be the density of the vapor times the volumetric flow rate coming in, and then the mass flow rate of the dry air, which is the density of the dry air times the volumetric flow rate coming in. That'll be fine. What's rho of V coming in? That'll be the partial pressure of the vapor coming in, the molar mass of the vapor divided by R bar T coming in. Then you multiply by AV coming in. Likewise, the partial pressure of the dry air coming in, the molar mass of the dry air divided by R bar T1 AV coming in. So you can calculate these two components, add them up. You don't have to worry about doing this multiplication there. Or you can just make this one calculation and multiply by 1 plus omega 1. Either way, you get the same answer. My question is, if the problem is basically that moist air comes in with that volumetric flow rate, so how come that volumetric flow rate isn't first the moist air? How come you have to multiply it by a row? Okay. Um, there's, if I think of one cubic meter... Okay, 
There's so many kilograms of vapor in it. There's so many kilograms of dry air in it. If I add them both up, I get so many kilograms of moist air in it. But it's the same one cubic meter volume. All right. Let's uh, take a look at the next part here. What is the relative humidity at the exit? How do you calculate the relative humidity at the exit? I need more space, don't I? Uh, insert new page. Uh, scroll down maybe a little bit. Okay. How do I calculate the relative humidity at the exit? It'll be the partial pressure of the vapor at the exit divided by P sat at the exit at uh, 22 degrees C. How do I get the partial pressure of the water vapor at the exit? It's really hard. But let me ask you this. Omega 1 versus Omega 2. Oh, man. What is omega again? I forgot. Humidity ratio. What's the ratio of how many kilograms of vapor per kilogram of dry air? I didn't have any vapor condense. Does omega change as that flows through the system? That's the key that makes the life a lot easier. You say, oh, omega 2 is equal to omega 1. I calculated it already. So omega 2 is equal to 0 0.622. The partial pressure of vapor at the exit divided by the total pressure minus partial pressure of vapor at the exit. All right. This equation right here, could I use it to calculate partial pressure of vapor at the exit? Yes. I just have to do a little algebra manipulation. It's not that hard. But um, you calculate omega-1, that's equal to omega-2, 0.662 PV2 divided by P minus PV2. You calculate the partial pressure of the vapor at a state two. Now, since P doesn't change, if I say I calculated omega one, isn't it 0.622 partial pressure vapor at the inlet, uh, total pressure at the inlet minus the partial pressure of the vapor at the inlet? And if P didn't change here versus here, then guess what didn't change? PV one is equal to PV two. So it makes it even easier, right? So there you go. Last one, part D, the rate of heat transfer from the moist air in so many kilowatts. I don't have time for that one because I want to give you a little quiz.